Good morning, everybody. Yeah, Welcome. Put this together. Good to see us all. <laughs> We're going to start this morning with some worship, singing. If you can stand, if you want to, stand and sing with us. You ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. Waiting on the screen to pop up. <laughs>
All right. Well, that's, uh, that's good singing. It's good to see everybody today. Uh, we're going to do something a little different this morning than we normally do. Um, we're going to do a read and response. Some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, we haven't used these books in a while, but if you'll find the blue hymnal that's in the seat back, open to uh, number 658. All right, I'm going to read the part of the worship leader, and everyone's going to read the part of everyone. Does that sound good? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Children of God, number 658. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. You've got to have a little more enthusiasm than that. <laughs> Couldn't read yet, yeah, sorry. All right. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. All right. <clears throat> Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we are all to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's right. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. And how we set our hearts at rest in His presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask, because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is Amen. All right. Thank you. Well, with all that, we're continuing this morning in our study through Romans. And just a few reminders that I'd like to give as we uh, get started this morning. Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome, Italy. Now, everybody knows where Rome is, right, on the map. You look at the uh, map of Italy, and it's kind of like a boot, and there's a knee and right below the knee on the west coast is Rome. So, Paul had not been to Rome yet. He knew some of the believers through acquaintance, but he really didn't know a lot of the people in that church. However, he did understand some of the issues that they had because Paul was a shepherd of many churches, and he knew what God's people go through. Uh, Paul has three main purposes in this letter. First is to make clear the gospel that he preaches, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, he wants to talk about what are essential matters to faith in Jesus and what are non-essential matters. And third, he wants to discuss how believers should deal with each other on both of these. Now, one of the reasons for this is the church in Rome, like many other churches at that time, is made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Jewish believers are culturally Jewish people. They're Hebrew by origin. They're uh, affiliated with the Jewish religion. They've come up uh, in in the Old Testament scriptures. The Gentiles have not had that background, and they have come into the faith through hearing the good news about Jesus Christ. Now, Jews who follow Jesus have also heard the good news about Jesus Christ. So you have two groups of people who are brought together in one family of faith through Jesus. Jews have grown up adhering, following the laws of Moses. Gentiles have not, and they don't see those as essential practices because the early church said they're not. So a division has occurred because of this. It's not only in Rome, but it's also happened in many of the other churches at this time. And Paul is working to address it through good teaching so that these believers are reconciled to one another. All right? Now, today, 
We're going to be in Romans chapter 7, looking at what's being said about sin and salvation. Can I get the clicker from you? Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Now, as we prepare to look at the scripture this morning, let's pray together. Uh, would somebody like to give thanks for our time together uh, and for God's word this morning? Jim, can you do that? Sure. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you for bringing us together again, Lord. I pray that you would um, uh, be with us and bless us with good fellowship, Father. I pray that you'd help us to listen to your word well, Lord. Uh, think about it well. Uh, help us to uh, figure out what it means for ourselves, Lord, what we should do, and give us courage to do that. I pray now that you would uh, just bless us again with unity, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As I mentioned, we're going to be in Romans chapter 7. We'll be looking at verses uh, 13 through 25. Verses 13 through 25. Uh, if you're using one of the Bibles in the seat back, it's the white book, and that should be around page 960. I think Bethany's got it open, so she might be able to tell us. Is that right? Yeah, 961. 961. All right. Now, as usual, I'd like to go over a little background information so we all uh, come get up to speed on where we're joining in. And at this stage of the letter, Paul has turned his attention. He's, he's been talking about the gospel, right? He's turned his attention at this stage from justification by faith to sanctification, now, justification is God giving you a right standing with him. That's not based on what you've done, but it's based on what Jesus has done on the cross. Okay? And it is through faith, through believing what God has said and trusting in him, and trusting yourself to him, giving your life to him, all right, that you enter this. Sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, right? When you have faith in Christ, it's because you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. He enters you, right, and he works to sanctify you. Uh, sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in believers throughout the remainder of their lives. It involves being set apart for God's service, growing in moral and spiritual maturity, and it's enabled by the presence of the Holy Spirit living within the believer. Uh, in a nutshell, you could say sanctification is a lifelong process where God essentially moves you toward, uh, you know, what, what God has made you through justification, he moves you toward that through sanctification. Now, Paul is well aware of the struggles that Christians face during this time, especially coming to terms with two seemingly competing realities. God says, I'm righteous and my sins are forgiven but I still find daily that I sin. How does that work? So Paul has devoted chapters 6, 7, and 8 to different aspects of this. In chapter 6, as we've gone through, uh, Paul basically says that believers are to walk in a new way of life because they have died with Christ. And as he is raised, we are also raised. We become a new creation. Uh, chapter 7, Paul says that sin is still a daily reality during this time. And chapter 8, as we'll get into, uh, Paul discusses the work of the Holy Spirit in us and the fact that struggles right, and suffering actually do the work that God has intended and he will reveal at a point in the future uh, his glory. Now, at this same time, Right, going through all of this, at the same time, Paul is also helping Christians to understand the role of the laws of Moses. What role did they play prior to Christ's coming? What role do they play in the church now? Uh, so he's continuing in this discussion as we join in at verse 13 of chapter 7. <clears throat> all right, beginning there. Therefore, did what is good cause my death? Absolutely not. On the contrary, sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. 
For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh. I am unspiritual, sold into sin's power. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I don't want to do, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover this principle. When I want to do what is good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this dying body? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. All right. How should we understand this? Right? How should we understand this? You know, that's a question that um, many in the church have asked over the ages because this is a really challenging section of Scripture. Who is Paul describing? Is it an unsaved person? Is it a person who is saved, but they're struggling with sin? Is Paul talking about himself? If so, was it him before he was saved, or is it him right now? You know, some in the church have said that Paul's describing an unregenerate person. That would be a non-Christian, someone in whom the Holy Spirit is not living. In support of this, they would note how Paul says things that are not typical or even not true of a believer. Verse 14, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Verse 18, I know that nothing good lives in me. Verse 24, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me? Though Paul is writing in the first person, he's using the words I and me. All of these statements seem to indicate that he's talking about life prior to faith in Christ. The Christian is not unspiritual. The Holy Spirit lives in every believer. Right? The Holy Spirit has regenerated them and given them a new birth. How can a Christian say, I'm unspiritual? The believer is not sold as a slave to sin. Believers have actually been purchased out of slavery to sin through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Right, And how can a believer say that nothing good lives in me when Christ lives in each of us? Why would a believer have to ask who will rescue me if they've been saved by Jesus? And those are all of the arguments that are put forward by folks who look at this and say Paul must be talking about someone prior to faith in Christ. Now, in support of the view that Paul is describing a Christian who's dealing with the daily struggles of sanctification, that person would say, well, wait a minute. Paul is writing in the present tense. That's actually a change from verses 7 through 12 where he was writing in the past tense. They would point out the high regard that this person has for God's laws or God's word. (laughs) Verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual. The law is from God. Verse 16, I agree that the law is good, right? This is somebody who knows that the word of God is from God, that God is good, and that his word is good. They would also point to the fact that this person wants to do what's right. They want to obey God. Verse 18, I have the desire to do what is good. Verse 19, I'm not doing the good I want to do. Verse 21, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Verse 22, in my inner being, I delight in God's laws. You know, to agree that God is good and His Word is from Him requires knowing Him as Lord. 
It's typically a regenerate person who agrees that God's word is his word and who wants to obey it. Uh, It would also be the situation of any Jewish person who's grown up learning that God's law is from God and you need to obey it. And this person would also say, what Christian can't relate to wanting to do good but finding that they've got trouble carrying it out, right? Has anybody not had that situation who's a believer, I want to do good but I have trouble carrying it out, right? That evil thoughts and desires uh, compete with the good ones, right? That's the struggle that Christians face daily, isn't it? On top of that, they would say, isn't this actually the section of the letter where Paul is dealing with sanctification, he's dealing what hap- with what happens in the life of somebody after they come to faith in Christ. So why would he be talking about someone prior to faith in Christ? Now, there's another alternative and one I feel we should seriously consider. It's that Paul is describing a Jew who loves the Lord but does not yet know Jesus Christ one who is earnestly trying to carry out the laws of Moses, but who sees that at every turn they can't always do it. So their mind has been informed through the law of God to what is good. They have the law, but their flesh, their sinful nature, their body is weak. They know that the law requires perfect obedience. So as much as they get right, they find that there's just as much, if not more, that they get wrong, and they have to come to the humble confession, I'm a wretched person. Who will save me? Because I certainly can't do it myself. You know, based on the context, I think it's best to see this as a continued discussion, right, of the role of the laws, the role that the laws of Moses played Uh, for God's people prior to Christ. Uh, As we talked about last week, when you look at what Paul's saying in uh, verses 1 through 12, he says that the laws revealed the situation of sin and death that existed. They should have shown God's people the prison they were in, that no human being is capable of doing all that God requires, that God takes sin very seriously, that He does require absolute righteousness, and that no human being can achieve this. Right? If you would uh, go back to what we talked about last week, we understand that through Adam, sin and death entered the picture. And through Christ, God gives life and holiness. Everyone is born here into Adam. Even Jewish people are born here into Adam. And nobody can move from here to here unless God moves them. Understanding this situation, having God's law, showed the Jewish people, you're here, and you're powerless to get yourself there. You have to rely on me. This should have caused God's people to have to turn to him in repentance, to trust in his justice and mercy, and to look forward to the one he's always promised, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. You know, Paul can write about this situation in the first person because he's been in, on both sides of it, right? Paul was a Jew trying to earn salvation through the law prior to Christ. And Paul is a Jew who's been redeemed by Christ, given a new birth by the Holy Spirit, and who is daily living for Christ, seeking to live this new life. So what I'd like for us to do today is go back through all of this section by section. Uh, I'd like to clearly get at what the Scripture is saying, and I'd like to give voice to the perspectives that we've just gone through, right? Because each one of them is valid and well-supported in the history of the church, and each one of them will lead you actually to the same place. Right? Whether you think that Paul's talking about an unregenerate person prior to Christ, whether you think he's talking about a Christian struggling with sin daily, whether you think he's talking about himself before or after Jesus, 
whichever perspective you read this with, it all brings you to the same place, right? The need to give your life to Jesus and to continue following him each day. So with that, let's review what we've read starting at verse 13. All right, so just to go back through that, Paul says, Therefore, did what is good cause my death? Absolutely not. On the contrary, sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. Now, again, I've, I've mentioned that Paul has been writing in a style where what he's doing is anticipating the potential thoughts or objections that people might have, and he's stating them, and then he's responding to them, right? Based on everything that Paul has said in verses 1 through 12, right, um, he's talked about the fact that God gave the laws of Moses to his people not in order to save them from their sin, but to show them the full extent of their sin to show them that sin is utterly sinful, it's sinful beyond measure, to give them the complete scope of what is opposed to him. Now, God wanted his people to do what he said. He wanted them to obey the laws, but there was no way that they could do all of it, and God knew that. So it had the effect of showing God's people what is sin, right? I don't know that I'm here. I don't know what all of these things are. But when God gives me his word, then I can see clearly what is sin and that it's producing death in me. <clears throat> so this is a transitional verse. It's basically summing up what Paul has said earlier, that the law is good, that sin used a holy thing to produce death, but it's not the law that produces death. It's sin that does that. So, in other words, the law of Moses didn't produce the death of God's people, right? It revealed the true nature of sin, and it showed them the death they were already in. Now, what we should understand here is that death is the result of sin. And I'm going to put that up on the screen. Death is the result of sin. This is a key understanding with respect to the gospel, right? We understand from the Bible that Adam and Eve were created by God, that they had an original innocence, right? They were created good. They had committed no sins. They were innocent. When they chose to do what God said don't do, and they had clear understanding of that, he said that tree in the middle of the garden, that one right there, don't eat of that one because the day you do, you'll surely die, right? Every other tree is here for you to eat, but it's that one, right, that I don't want you to think about or touch or whatever. They knew clearly what God said, and they chose to do something different. That's a transgression. That's to know what you're supposed to do and to choose to do something different. It's also called disobedience, right? Well, this choice for sin brought spiritual death separation from God. Uh, it brought an eventual physical death. Their bodies then later died. So death is the result of sin. What Adam and Eve have passed on to all of their children, all of their descendants, every one of us, every human being born from the original two parents, right, is this situation. We're born into it. We don't always understand that we're born into it. We need God's word to show it to us. You know, many people don't see the life that we're born into as one that's spiritually dead. Uh, we will eventually learn, if you live long enough or you have enough experiences, you will learn that people die and that you will die, right? But death didn't come from God. A lot of people wonder, why do people die? Right? It's, there's something really wrong with death in the sense that you understand that um, it's unnatural. God created people, body and soul, to live forever right? as a unit. There's something about death that shows us, hey, the situation's really wrong here. 
people go away and they don't come back, right? Uh, a fellowship, a, a, a friendship, a, a relationship is, has ended. And there's no replacement for that person, right? You can't just uh, say, oh, you know, wait a little while, you'll get over that. You know, oh, get another dog or get another child or get another husband or wife. No, nobody replaces anybody. That person is gone. Um, what people don't typically understand is that death is something that came not from God, but from us. It came from our choice to sin. So God gave his law to show his people that sin is completely sinful. It is utterly sinful, right? It is sinful beyond measure. And they couldn't do anything to change the condition of death they were in. All right, does that make sense? All right, going to verses 14 through 20, now let's take a look at those again. <clears throat> For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh, or I am unspiritual. Some of your translations might say that. Sold into sin's power, for I do not understand what I am doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. So now I'm no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh or in my sinful nature. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the things I want to do, but I practice the evil I don't want to do. Now, if I do what I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me that does it. All right, <clears throat> what I want to point out here is that this section answers the questions that should come about from verses 7 through 12 that we went through last week, which are basically how, if the law is good and intended for life, did it put God's people to death? And again, the answer is it wasn't the law that put them to death. It was the law that showed them they're already dead, right? Weakened in our fallen nature, people have trouble doing what is good. The law clearly shows what's good and what's not, so it shows the operation of sin within us. It reveals something that would otherwise not be seen, right? We wouldn't know what sin is unless God told us. So what God's people should have clearly understood from the law is, I'm a sinner who can't do everything God wants. That's what it should have shown them. The person being described here obviously has the law. They have the Word of God, right? This is a person who wants to do what the law says, so they agree, verse 16, that the law is good. If I want to do it, then I must agree that it's good, right? And so then I'm basically answering the question for myself. Is the law good or bad? Well, obviously the law is good. It's not bad if I agree that it's good and I want to do it. But in the weakness of this person's sinful nature, they can't carry it out, verse 18. So they have to confess, there is a power at work in me that's greater than my own will. There is a power at work in me, right, and that's the power of sin, verse 20. This struggle, I want to point out, shows the persistent nature of sin during this life. However, it doesn't avoid responsibility for sinning. In verse 17 and 20, when uh, Paul is saying about this person that they have to confess, basically, that it is not what I want to do, but it's sin at work in me that's doing it, that's not a rejection of personal responsibility. That's simply a confession of personal helplessness. But it's also recognizing a very key reality and that reality is my fallen nature is inclined towards sin. And I have a really hard time bringing that in check myself, right? I can't necessarily escape it through my own efforts. Uh, and so it brings us to another point that I want to just make as we're coming along through here, which is this. 
Sin is a powerful force in the human life. Sin is a powerful force in the human life. Right? I can't imagine anybody who has come to understand something from God's Word and seen that something that they do is not right and then had trouble stopping that. Sin is a powerful force in the human life. Now, if you'll notice what Paul has been doing in this section is he's been personifying sin, right? What is personifying? Well, it's taking something that's not really alive and making it out as though it is alive, right? As though it has a, a mind or a will of its own, right? He's been personifying sin. He's been representing it as though it has its own way of operating, its own desires, its own activities. <clears throat> He's describing the struggle that exists between the mind and the body. The mind knows God's law and wants to do it. The sinful nature has nothing good in it, and so there's a battle of sorts that takes place between the two. The mind that knows what's good and the body that is subject to the sinful nature. This person who he's talking about is confused. They don't understand why they can't do the things they want to do. Verse 15. <clears throat> you know, for a Jewish person trying to live up to the law without Christ, they should have seen at every turn, I'm frustrated, right? Finding that they just can't do everything right. Uh, even what they want to do, they don't always do. That's what Paul's describing here. But what I'd also like to point out is this isn't only the experience of a Jewish person who has the laws of Moses and is trying to do them. This is the experience of every Christian too. Even though believers are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and we have His help, we often fail to meet the radical moral and ethical demands of the gospel. Right? What does that mean, moral and ethical demands of the gospel? Well, Christ, who is our law, said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Is there a Christian who does that? to love our neighbors as ourselves, and he said that there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. We are to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, give freely to those who ask from us, go the extra mile even when those who want us have pressed us into service, have kind of twisted our arm or forced us into it. We are to turn the other cheek to those who strike us, to not resist someone who steals from us, but to actually give them even more than they're trying to take. We are to do what's right for our brothers and sisters, even when it's not comfortable, even when they may not like it, putting their relationship with God above our relationship to them. We're to refrain from what we may be justified in doing if it's going to hurt our brothers and sisters when we do it. And we are to carry one another's burdens. As Paul says in Galatians 6, that fulfills the law of Christ. We are to weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice, to be people who make peace with others and do good to all. Does anybody else find that a pretty tall order? The persistent nature of sin in this life makes these things difficult even for mature Christians. Mm -hmm. So something I want to point out here, again, we're in a section where Paul's talking about sanctification. Sanctification is not always a pleasant process. In fact, I can rarely think of a time for me that it has been. <clears throat> it's often quite prickly as sin is exposed in your life. And God, through cutting and pruning, right, through that work of cutting away what's bad and pruning so that new and more growth can come, right, deals with these things in your life. What the believer needs to understand is what Jesus told his disciples in John 15. 
you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you, but understand the work of my father. My father is the vine dresser, and he cleans every vine that's in me. He prunes every vine that's in me. Why is that? So that it will produce more fruit. Uh, This goes along with Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, what's the heart? Well, when you find heart in the Bible, sometimes it's talking about the organ in your chest. Most of the time it's talking about the inner person, the human will. The Holy Spirit is the inner witness. He enters us and he testifies within us, right? guiding us into all truth, leading us in the way of the Lord, uh, making our lives a testimony to the life of Jesus Christ. He does this through his word so that your life becomes more and more like the life of Jesus. Now, some people say, oh, the life of Jesus is wonderful, right? Didn't people love him, and didn't he do all kinds of miracles, and so on and so forth? Well, the testimony to the life of Jesus is the cross, that uh, God humbled himself to the point of being a slave, uh, to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so what... God is working to bring about in your life as he molds you more and more into the form of Jesus is the life of the cross, right? Some people might say a cruciform life, one that takes on that of a servant, of a slave. If you remember the example that Jesus gave his disciples the night before he died, he saw them arguing about who, like for the third or fourth time, who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to be first, I'm going to be first, I'm going to be at Jesus' right hand, I'm going to be at Jesus' left hand. And coming into this situation, he took a towel and wrapped it around his waist, right? and he washed their feet. And they're like, oh my gosh, why are you doing this? This is the lowest possible thing. The, the, the worst of the household servants does this, and you're our master. Well, I've given you an example to follow. And following that example... He went to the cross. Yeah. All right. So for the believer, what we need to understand is is through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come on in, guys. Uh, For the believer, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's one living in us whose power is greater than the power of sin. And that leads us to uh, verses 21 through 24 that I want to read and discuss. Um, We're just at the end of Romans 7, um, so if you want to open there, we're doing verses 13 through 25. We're looking at uh, 21 through 24 right now. All right, so going back through there. So I discover this principle. When I want to do good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, I joyfully agree with God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this dying body or this body of death? Uh, Some of your translations might say it that way. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, to the law of sin. All right, I went through 25. Figured why not. All right, so what I want to point out here is these verses basically sum up that the law of God revealed the existence of another law. Right? The law of God revealed the existence of this situation, that this principle is operating even within God's people. Uh, it revealed something that wouldn't have been seen or wouldn't have been exposed if not for God's law having come to the mind of this person. The other law, the one that was shown to be at work, is the law of sin and death to which this person says, I'm a prisoner. 
And what's being said is, though through the existence of good desires and evil desires side by side, right? So through the existence of good and evil desires side by side, a conflict began to take place, right? A love for God's law in this person's mind, but a weakness to carry it out in his body or his weakened condition, his sinful nature, his flesh. As though his mind was a prisoner to God and his body was still a prisoner to sin. The fact that Paul confesses to be a prisoner of the law of sin, verse 23, is a strong indication that he's talking about a pre-Christian experience, right? Paul has already said in chapter 6 that believers are no longer slaves to sin and that believers have been set free from sin through the death of Christ, through the crucified body of the Messiah. But that Paul has also said we must work to put the old self to death and not allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies, again in chapter 6, also indicates that believers are going to have an ongoing struggle with sin. There's a reality that's as good as done, but there's also the fact that it's kind of playing out over time. Right? And what I want to point out is, even if who Paul's talking about is any unsaved Jewish person who was trying to do what the law requires, or he's talking about himself prior to coming to Christ, Christian believers can experience the exact same struggle between their mind and their body that Paul describes here. As a reminder from last week, God gave the laws of Moses again to his people in order to show their need for him, right? To show a few things. Here's a way of life that's different from the world. Here's a way of life that is different from your neighbors. All of this presents a witness to me and conforms to my desires. But first and foremost, it should have shown them their need to rely on God. Now, he gave them this law to train them in a new way of life. The reason God's people have to train in a new way of life is we've learned a very different one from our lives in this world. Right? This is the struggle that exists between the mind and the body or the flesh for God's people, just as much now as it ever has. So what I want to do is spend a, a moment on this topic right, of the mind and the body. Uh, did you ever find that sometimes you do things without thinking about them? like it's almost automatic, um, that your body seemingly reacts or responds, maybe in some ways that you don't want it to, before you really know it, before your mind is engaged to say, oh, you know, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> on the one hand, you've got worldly programming, right? We're all accustomed to growing up in this world, in this environment, in this life. Uh, we come up through our families as kids, Right? And we learn how to interact with our brothers and sisters and our moms and dads and uh, our friends and all of this. And you kind of learn a way of life like that. You also have relationships with other people that teach you certain ways of acting and reacting. Right? And generally, in this world, there's a way of going. Uh, your body can get kind of trained into some things, and then your mind is enlightened by God's Word. You start to see what's really right and wrong. And so your thinking starts to get better, but sometimes your activities don't follow right away. I, I would liken this to driving in a car and talking on the phone. Has anybody ever driven in the car and talked on the phone at the same time? No. Oh, yeah. You know, or for kids, you know, riding a bike. You ride a bike and your feet keep going on the pedals, right? You don't always have to tell your feet to keep going on the pedals, do you? They just keep going. You breathe without telling your lungs to breathe, right? Your heart beats without your mind saying, hey, it's time, you know, right? So when you're driving in the car and you're talking on the phone, I know at least in my experience, I can sometimes get almost all the way home or where I'm going and not really remember exactly the route that I took. You know, I just know that I got there. Uh, I'm not paying attention to every traffic signal or every other decision that another car is making. I'm kind of responding to that, not in a dangerous way. I'm kind of responding to that because 
your mind is capable of giving your body certain tasks to do and then not using all of its cognitive thinking, all of its higher energy to do those tasks. So it's kind of like you're on autopilot. You know, if you relate this to the way that you've been trained in life, like if you're somebody who's uh, been hit and you've always learned to hit back, well, you might know it's wrong to hit back, but when somebody strikes you in the arm or something like that, you might automatically lash out. Um, you know, if you're somebody who's always come up around uh, gossip or things like that, you know, it could be just hearing that can almost cause your mouth to salivate, you know, like you just want to speak it, right? I, you're hearing it, and all of a sudden, you just, you, it's, it's ready to come out. You might know that's wrong, but you're programmed in such a way through your previous experiences that your, your, your body is just kind of anticipating what to do. You know, you can have compulsions that you war against. You know, like uh, you could be somebody who knows that you need to stop using the credit card, right? But you see things and your hand is almost going to your wallet immediately, even though you don't have the cash, but you know the credit card's in there, right? Things like that can happen. Um, so one of the things that we need to understand is the mind that's trained by God's word will learn what his will is, what he desires. We have to take actions based on what we know his will is, but we may find that we almost already want to take other actions, and so there's a lot of work involved to start realizing what you do automatically and changing from that. You know, the heart or the human will has to become subject to God. You know, what's always been necessary in God's people is the work of the Holy Spirit to help us. Uh, the fallen human will is rebellious. A change has to come in the human heart by faith, and this is the work of the Holy Spirit to give us new birth. And there's an ongoing work to do in this life. There's ongoing work to do in this life because, as Jesus said, right, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? We have to continue learning how to respond to the Holy Spirit. So what God's word should have shown his people then, just as it should show us now, is I'm weakened in my natural condition. I can't do everything God wants me to do. Even through the help of his spirit, I'm still finding myself doing things that I know I shouldn't do. So it should have brought about this realization, number one, we need God to save us, and number two, the human heart has to be changed by him. No matter what view you take about who Paul's describing here, it should be clear that all people, when they're enabled by God to see it, will see their sin. Uh, they'll have to admit, as much good as I do, there's probably as much evil. Even when I do good, it's not always necessarily that good. And even what I do get right, there's still plenty more that I don't. So at the end of the day, if I'm comparing myself to God, if I'm looking at myself compared to what He says in His Word, instead of comparing myself to my neighbor, instead of um, comparing myself to somebody down the street, if I'm being honest about how I'm acting in my marriage, if I'm being honest about how I'm treating my kids, if I'm being honest about how I'm really doing my work at my job, if I'm looking at whether I really honor my parents, if I'm really compassionate to all and try to do good to everybody, if I'm really serving God with my whole being, remember some of these things we already talked about, I'm going to pretty clearly see what a wretch I am. And I should have to ask the question then, who will save me? You know, truly seeing yourself in light of God's word should be a humbling experience. But it's the necessary experience that both brings people to Christ and continues moving people toward Christ. In verse 24, this person makes the confession, what a wretched man I am, and asks the question, who will save me from this body of death or this dying body? In verse 25, 
this person answers that question. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul goes on then to restate the findings of the whole situation, right, in verse 25. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. Wretched, the word wretched in this context means miserable and distressed. It's an expression of despair, and it describes the feeling of being pulled two directions. Right? This person knows in their mind the penalty for sin and has a desire to serve God, but finds in their body that they continue to commit sin, that they're unable to carry out what's truly good. You know, the closest thing I can relate this to is declaring bankruptcy. Has anybody ever declared bankruptcy? You know, whether you have or not, the understanding is like, okay, well, I know that I owe these debts, and I know that the bills keep coming, and I know that I can't pay them, and I know that I need help. All right, that's why you declare bankruptcy, because you're not able to pay the bills. You're not able to pay the debts. You have no hope of being able to do that. And so you need help. You need the judge to step in. He's got to say, okay, this is how the debts are going to be handled, and this is how you're going to do things now, right? So what agreeing with God's word has basically brought this person to the understanding of is I'm bankrupt. I have no hope to pay my debts. I have no ability to do the things that are required, and I need help but who will save me, right? That's the question, who will help me? And it brings us to the point that I'd like to make today, the main point that this scripture makes, which is this. Salvation or help or deliverance has always been through Christ alone, right? Who will save me? The only one who can, Jesus Christ. People prior to Christ, I want to point out, have always been saved through trusting in God's promise to save. And people after Christ have always been saved by trusting in Him, trusting in the fact that God has done it in Christ. Before Christ, however, they didn't know exactly how God was going to do it. They just knew that He promised He would. The gospel, quite simply, is the God who created is the God who redeems and will ultimately restore all things. He is the one who judges sin and has taken the judgment for it in our place. Genesis tells us that nothing existed except for God and He made all things. The Bible tells us multiple times that Jesus Christ is the Creator. Right? Uh, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, James 2, multiple other places we're told Jesus Christ is the God who created he is the visible image of the invisible God. All things were made by Him, for Him, and through Him, and in Him all things hold together. Uh, the God who created entered the creation. He came into what He made, truly becoming one of us, while still being fully Himself, while still being fully God. He fulfilled all the requirements of His own laws, gave His life willingly in our place on the cross, going through the death that each of us deserve and will experience, bearing the full penalty of our sin in His own body, and taking His life up again from the grave after three days in the tomb. In this way, He's reconciled all people to Himself who will believe in what He's done so that we can have His presence in us now and know for sure of the eternal life to come. Though believers have truly been rescued from this dying body, our bodies will still die. The effects of this fallen world and existence will run their course, and you know, a lot of people might say, well, why? Why is that? Well, just as our Lord humbled Himself 
Death is the final humbling experience he'll bring each of us through. Following Jesus, there are many deaths that believers will have to die, right? Deaths to my selfish desires, death to uh, my sinful nature, death to, uh, um, you know, any number of things, right? There are many deaths that believers will die ahead of the physical death that will all die. But each one of these is a confession of our own spiritual bankruptcy and a deepening of our trust in the giver and owner of all things. If there's nothing else that death shows us, it's that each one of us is going to go down to the grave and not one of us can do anything about it. It doesn't matter how famous or obscure you are. It doesn't matter how rich or poor. It doesn't matter how popular or recluse or introverted you might be. It doesn't matter what level of society you've climbed to or you haven't doesn't matter what you have built or whether you'll leave nothing behind. Death is the great leveling field of humanity, right, where all these things disappear. In death, everything where you could say, well, this is mine, or I've done that, or that belongs to me, it's all taken away. It's all gone. And when your body is raised from the dead at the resurrection, then you will know without a doubt that there's only one reason you're there. That's Jesus Christ. As the scripture tells us, on that day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. This will be to the glory of God the Father, but that confession will be eternal life to some. It will be eternal damnation to others. It all depends on whether you come to see your spiritual bankruptcy now or not. If there's anything the laws of Moses and the life of Christ show us, it's that God requires perfection. The slightest sin blemishes the perfect record. All the good deeds in the world can't erase a single one of those blemishes. They can't move us from imperfection to perfection. Once the sin has been committed, each of us is morally bankrupt. Our only hope, our only hope is to have that sin forgiven, to have it covered by the atonement of the only one who is altogether perfect. You know, when we sin, our only option is repentance. Without repentance, the Bible is clear there's no forgiveness. We must come before God in contrition, brokenness of heart, not a desire to escape punishment, but a real sorrow for the wrong things that we've done. Uh, a real sorrow that can only come from a true understanding, the true understanding, I have sinned against the God of the universe. Repentance is a true turn toward God, and it's the mark of regeneration. It's met with the full acceptance of God, the full forgiveness of your sin, and it should be no surprise to us that God keeps his word. The start of your walk with Jesus, however, is not the end of your struggle with sin. The call of the gospel is not to come and accept Jesus, right, and somehow be instantly made perfect. But neither is the call of the gospel to come and accept Jesus and continue to wallow in your sin. I'm not trying to look at anybody intentionally. The call of the gospel is to come to trust in God's forgiveness, believe what God will make you into, and walk with him out of what you currently are. So believers should understand the security of salvation in Christ doesn't have to do with us, it has to do with him. Sin doesn't cause you to lose your salvation, and the evidence of the Spirit's work in you is to show you your sin and to help you deal with it, calling you to repent of it, and continue following Jesus. 
The fact of the matter is there's no Christian life that doesn't lead toward holiness because there's no Christian life that doesn't lead toward Christ. So as we close today, I'd like each of us to consider our relationship to him. If you haven't come to trust Jesus yet, do you recognize your need for him? Is the weight of your sin weighing heavy on you? Are you willing to confess this to him and receive forgiveness? If you are a follower of Christ, where are you still struggling with sin? It will be lifelong. It will be every day. It will be different areas that get revealed to you. As that happens, are you willing to confess this to Jesus, to deepen your dependence on him and to continue in this new way of life? All right. Uh, Those are questions I'd like for each of us to consider uh, as we sing a final song. And um, if you'd like to, you can stand. If you'd like to remain in your seat, you can do that. Uh, But we'll sing. Well worth it. See